I would like to say that for me, it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce my good old friend, Dr. Sidney Magela Tomas, who will be presenting the next lecture at our Shallow Lakes Conference. Dr. Sidney, or just Ney as we call him, is an associate professor of ecology at the Center for Research in Limnology, Geology and Aquaculture at Maringá State University in Paraná, in the South region of Brazil. Dr. Sidney is an aquatic ecologist working on the ecology and management of aquatic macrophytes in large reservoirs and wetlands of Paraná River. His research focuses on the use of aquatic macrophytes and related organisms to test ecological concepts about biological invasions and biodiversity. He currently serves as an associate editor in chief of Hydrobiologia, an associate editor of journals such as Biological Invasions, Perspective in Ecology and Conservation, among others. Dr. Sidney has been an inspiring supervisor for many graduate and undergraduate students. Worth mentioning too, Dr. Sidney has been involved in, in an initiative aimed at improving the quality of Brazilian public basic schools and at increasing environmental awareness among young students. So without further delay, I would like to thank Ney for accepting our invitations to share with us some of, of his ideas on, on biological invasions. Ney, the word is all yours. Uh, but before uh, we ask questions to Ney, I would like to ask, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Tiago to, to Ney, Ney told, told me that his connection is, uh, is unstable at his university. So we're going to, to share uh, the video of the lecture recorded by him. Is that right, Ney? Yes, correct, Koch. And thank you very much for your words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it would be better if you use the, the lecture, the talk I sent you because we have low connectivity here. Uh -huh. So the connectivity became a problem, not only for biodiversity, but also for the meeting. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thiago, you can, can start. Hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank COCA and all the organizer committee of this Shallow Lakes meeting for their invitation to present this talk in this very important uh, conference. Um, I'll talk about the topic that have, has been the focus of interest in my research in the last 15 years. And I will basically talk to you about the role of the flood pools and connectivity on the success or unsuccess of non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. Um, I used a systematic survey conducted on the web of science, but of course I used it also for this review my own experience with the river floodplain ecosystems. In other words, papers that I knew about this issue. So I would say that this talk, this review, uh, is a mixture between a systematic and a non-systematic survey in the literature. It's very important to highlight since the beginning that this is not a, a review, a general review about non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. No, in contrast, it's an overview about what makes river floodplain ecosystems so different from other ecosystems in terms of invasions. So what makes an ecosystem peculiar when compared to a stream, river, lake or reservoir, for example. So I will develop five topics in my talk. Uh, first, I'll talk about some peculiarities of river floodplain ecosystems and of non-native species. And then I'll talk about the role of propagule pressure in river floodplain ecosystems. And then how 
environmental filters, both abiotic and biotic, are related to the flood pools. And then I will talk about the possibility that the flood pools enhance the chances of coexistence between native and non-native species. And at the end, I will summarize some uh, impacts or I will summarize how the impacts at short and long term caused by humans can influence the fate of non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. Okay, going to my first topic. What, what makes a river floodplain ecosystem so different from other types of uh, freshwater ecosystems? Okay, the main reason river floodplain ecosystems is, are treated as a peculiar type of aquatic ecosystem is the important role of what we call the flood pools. The flood pools is basically the oscillation of water levels and of river flow, of course, over the year. What results in a period of high waters or flooding and in another extreme period where there is the predominance of low waters or droughts. This flood pools influences the entire biota and also the abiotic um, environment. What, of course, will decrease or increase the possibility of non-native species to establish in a given river floodplain ecosystem. So, during the high water levels, owing to the increased connectivity among the, the uh, habitats of the floodplain, what happens is that most of these habitats become very similar because they receive both uh, inorganic material as well as organisms. So there is a tendency during the high water levels to increase the connectivity, what in turn increases the similarities among habitats of the floodplain. In contrast, during the low water periods, each particular habitat follows its own pathway. And then at the end of the, the, the dry period, these habitats are extremely heterogeneous among themselves. Then we can say that floodplains have a gradient of quasi-terrestrial habitats to totally aquatic habitats, and that the responses of species to the flood pools, which changes these habitats, so the response of species depends on species traits. This is valid not only for native, but also for non-native species that inhabit river floodplain ecosystems. Regarding non-native species, uh, we can say that the probability of success in any environment depends, first of all, on the, on the, sorry, first of all, on the propagule pressure. In other words, the higher is the propagule pressure, the higher is the probability of invasion in a given ecosystem but not only the success of a specific non-native species also depends on the biotic and abiotic filters represented in the biotic filters by, for example, predation and competition with native species and abiotic filters um, are, are related in this case with nutrients, light and temperature, for example. What is different in river floodplain ecosystems, using this figure as a, a basis, is that, first of all, the propagule pressure has a disproportionate role in river floodplain ecosystems. And, for example, I, I will talk about this in my next slides, but during the high water levels, during the floodings, there is what I call propagule pulses that repeat every year. And it has to do with the increase 
of the success of non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. In regard to abiotic and biotic filters, in river floodplain ecosystems, they are extremely affected by the flood pools. In other words, the high and low water levels affect both the abiotic medium as well as the native communities, making that these abiotic filters respond to the flood pools. Okay, the key message of this first topic is that the predictable or nearly predictable flood pools typical of river flood plain ecosystems makes this type of ecosystems unique in terms of invasion dynamics. Okay, let's go now to the second topic. How is propagable pressure related with the flood pools in river flood plain ecosystems? Uh, to start to talk about this topic, I would like to use this figure, which represents here the river main channel, here the floodplain with its local habitats. So, when a non native species first appears in a river floodplain ecosystems, it usually comes not only but usually it arrives through the river main channel. And then, during the high water levels, when there is a flooding, this species is immediately spread all over the floodplain to its habitats. So, this is what I called a propagule pulse. A propagule pulse is a characteristic to the river floodplain ecosystems because it occurs once a year and it repeats every year during the flooding. So it's exactly a propagule pulse that can repeat every year or at every flood period. This has everything to do with the topic of the shallow lakes meeting because it propagule pulses only occurs because of the enhanced connectivity during the high water levels. Of course, still during the high water levels, the species disappear for, from some local habitats because of, uh, especially but not only, abiotic filters, like for example turbidity that is not adequate, oxygen levels, flow, etc. During the low water periods, the species also disappear, or the individuals of the non-native species also disappear from local habitats, owing to biotic, but not only biotic filters, like for example competition and predation, which enhances during the low water periods. And then, in the following year, again during the high water levels, this few individuals which remained in the floodplain can spread again. In other words, another propagule pressure occurs during the high water levels. And what is very important here is that now the propagule pulses no longer depend depends on external sources of the propagules. And what I mean here by propagules is, for example, entire plants, stings, seeds, eggs of animals, of course, or even animals that disperse all over the floodplain. Still, in this regard, uh, we, we can say that this type of uh, pattern, in other words, the important role of propagule pulses in river floodplain ecosystems, is, uh, was found in several papers, dozens of papers, and this characteristic has been shown for riparian plants, for plants that colonize the ATTZ, that means the aquatic terrestrial transition zones in river floodplain ecosystems, also for macrophytes, invertebrates, 
fish and amphibians. Only to give you uh, two examples, the first one uh, about the, the important role of hydrochorios dispersal for these two species of, uh, of trees. And you can see here that the, the, the dispersion of these uh, trees uh, through uh, the floods can occur at dozens or even hundreds of kilometers, what shows clearly that high flows or floods are very important for dispersion and spread of these two species. Uh, here one example, one example of Cyprinus carpi or carp that you know is a very uh, are highly invasive fish species all over the world. It invades several floodplains in Australia, South America, North America, and Europe. And, and this paper shows that the fishes captured uh, when they are leaving the floodplain, they are related with wetland habitats and they, they, their abundance increases in high flows. In other words, the fishes that are leaving the wetlands, they leave the wetlands during high flows or during floods, showing the importance of floods for the spread of these species in river flooded plain ecosystems or in these specific river flooded plain ecosystems. Okay, going back to this figure, uh, so uh, we can say that during the high water periods, the invasive species can go back to the river main channel. And from the river, river main channel, the individuals can go upstream or downstream. In the case of fish, they can move upstream. In the case of plants, they can go downstream. And these individuals can even reach ecosystems outside the river floodplain ecosystem. So we can state that river floodplain ecosystems behave as stepping stones for new invasions, the same way reservoirs do for invasive species. And again, this characteristic has everything to do with the focus of the shallow lakes meeting, because the role of river floodplain ecosystems are as stepping stones for new invasions is associated with the role of connectivity among local habitats. There are many evidences of the role of stepping stones uh, species of river flood plain ecosystems. Uh, and these papers were conducted with plants, fish, or even snails. I will provide only one example, one evidence, this is a study conducted in, uh, Mediterranean, in a Mediterranean wetland which receives uh, seasonal floodings the same way river floodplains ecosystem do. And you can see here that the number of introduced species enhances in the outflow of this river floodplain or of this wetland during the high water period, evidencing that this wetland is working as a stepping stone for these species, which will invade other ecosystems. Uh, there is an important highlight here. Of course, there are other means for dispersion of non-native species, uh, like zookery through wild and domestic animals, human dispersal, dispersion, etc. It occurs uh, not only in river flooded plain ecosystems, but also in all types of ecosystems. And for this reason, uh, these types of dispersions are outside the scope of my presentation, but they exist, of course. Okay, the key messages of my second topic are that seasonal floods enhance the connectivity in river flooded plain ecosystems, what in turn causes propagation pulses in these ecosystems, and that river floodplain ecosystems may behave as stepping stones for new invasions in the landscape. 
Okay, let's go now to the third topic of my presentation. How are environmental filters related to the flood pools? Okay, and here only to remind you about this figure. So, two important uh, determinants of non-native species invasions are the abiotic and biotic filters. Uh, in short, we can say that the abiotic filters are more important in river floodplain ecosystems during flooding, during the high water periods. And they are related mainly with the flow, for example, underwater light, nutrients, etc. In contrast, during the low water levels, the biotic filters, but not only, of course, but mainly the biotic filters are very important. Because during the low water uh, periods, it has been shown that in river flood plain ecosystems, the competition and the predation becomes more important. So the, the, probably the, the tendency to higher biotic resistance occurs during the low water period. Uh, I would like to highlight before going to this topic that the relationship between the flood pools and the success of non-native species is highly idiosyncratic, unfortunately. When I started to, to prepare this presentation, I, 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 I expected to find clear patterns in this respect, but unfortunately this was not the case. There is a great degree of syncrasy, uh, sorry, of idiosyncrasy, and I will show you all these possibilities that I found in my survey. First, we can think about uh, invasive species and their life history. The first question, um, are invasive species whose life history is related to other flood plants more successful in river flood plain ecosystems where they are invasive? In other words, uh, life history associated with river flood plain ecosystems would facilitate the, the invasion of other river flood plain ecosystems for a specific species. Yeah, this occurs. Yeah, there are plenty of evidences uh, showing that indeed some species whose life history are associated with uh, river flood plain ecosystems, they uh, reach very successful histories outside their native ranges. One example refers, for, for example, for the carp, Cyprinus carp, uh, which invades several uh, river flood plain ecosystems all, all over the world and which is typical of river flood plain ecosystems in its native range. There is another example here in Brazil, for example, in the upper Paraná River floodplain, there are at least 10 species of fish which are invasive in these river floodplain ecosystems and all of them came from other river floodplain ecosystems in Brazil. So we could state that indeed a life history uh, of uh, associated with the river floodplain ecosystems in the native range will facilitate the invasion of non-native species outside uh, their ranges. But this is always true, not always, unfortunately. Uh, for example, for uh, plants and plants invading the aquatic terrestrial transition zone and also riparian corridors, it seems that any species that is adapted to episodic disturbances any type of disturbances, not only flood disturbances, but any types of disturbance. This, this species will do well, will grow well and establish well in river floodplain ecosystems and in riparian corridors. So it seems that species adapted or species with pre-adaptations to disturbances will colonize river floodplain ecosystems. And the same is true for aquatic species. I will take only three examples here. 
the liminoperna fertonei and corbicula flumini, two muscles, two freshwater muscles, hydrilla verticillata is a submersed uh, aquatic macrophyte. There are no evidences that these species are obligatorily um, or have, all these species have their life history associated with the river floodplain ecosystems in their native ranges. In other words, these species are found in lakes, rivers and reservoirs in their native ranges. However, these species grow and spread very well in river floodplain ecosystems all over the world. So, for aquatic invasive species, it seems that any species that have high reproduction and high growth rates, broad tolerance to environmental conditions, high plasticity and opportunity, opportunistic traits, species with this characteristic do well, spread and establish in river floodplain ecosystems. So, it's not necessary to have a life history associated with floodplains to be successful. Okay, then I tried to find some patterns rela uh, related to how the floods and the droughts influence the non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. So, first, uh, I found strong evidences, massive evidences, that non-native species enhances they, their performance and they are more successful uh, after floods in river floodplain ecosystems. So, the floods would increase invasion success. Unfortunately, I also found several opposite examples. And the same is true for droughts. There are many evidences showing that for some species, and in this case mostly terrestrial species and species that colonize the aquatic terrestrial transition zones, are facilitated by drought. However, the opposite is also true. So again, there is a high degree of idiosyncrasy here. Let's talk first about the influence of flooding on non-native species success. Okay, what happens during the flooding is that flooding represents a disturbance not only in river floodplain ecosystems but in any ecosystem. And this disturbance reduces the uh, resistance to invasion because this, any type of disturbance, including uh, flooding, enhances the invasion windows, what means enhances the opportunities for, inv for invasion. And how does it happen? It happens firstly through increases of resources, for example, nutrients, light for plants or food for animals. So, the increases of resources for non-native species enhances their success in river floodplain ecosystems or in any other type of ecosystems. Another possibility is that the floods decrease the resource use by natives. So some native species uh, decrease their populations during flooding. If the population of native species are decreased, so their resistance to invasion also decreases and in this case there is an enhancement of invasion success. Of course, both conditions may occur and all these situations open windows for new invasions. There are massive evidences that flooding really increases non-native species success in river floodplain ecosystems. So, there are evidences for riparian and aquatic terrestrial transition zone plants, there are evidences for macrophytes and there are evidences for fish. However, I would like to highlight here that most of these examples come from river floodplain ecosystems 
where the natural flood pools has been changed. But anyway, the flooding increased in all these examples the success of non-native species. I will show you only one example for uh, plants inhabiting the riparian zones. You can see in this example that both the percentage of exotic species as well as their uh, number of individuals increase in direction of the river channel exactly where the floods are more intense. In other words, it seems that exotic species in riparian corridors are more successful where the floods are more intense. And this supports the role of floods for um, the successful invasion of these riparian corridors. As I told you, I found also uh, contrasting evidences. In other words, for several other species, the floods decrease the non-native species success. And here there are several abiotic filters, like underwater light, scoring of vegetation, low oxygen concentrations, etc. And these evidences come also from riparian plants and also plants inhabiting the aquatic terrestrial transition zones for aquatic macrophytes, invertebrates, fish and amphibians. And only to show one example, this is a, a paper that we published about the uh, Idrilla, Hydrilla verticillata. This is a submerged macrophyte, highly invasive in the Parana River. And you can see here that during the high water levels, the biomass of these plants decreases to near zero. And it remains like this for about six months then it recovers again. But at least for this species, the, the flooding had a, a negative influence on its biomass. And here a picture of Hydrilla verticillata in the river Parana. Okay, now I'll, I would talk to talk a little about the role of droughts. And there are several evidences for riparian vegetation, for aquatic macrophytes, and for fish that droughts increase the success of non-native species. And this is special valid for species that colonize the riparian corridors and the aquatic terrestrial transition zones. So these species, uh, of course, they are facilitated by the terrestrialization produced by droughts. Maybe you find it strange that some macrophytes take advantage of droughts, and it's true. I'll give you only one example, water hyacinth, for example. It does not uh, do well, does not survive in environments with high floods. So when floods are controlled, uh, several uh, lakes remain stable, with uh, the water level remains stable. So water hyacinth do very well in establishing this type of, of environments. So we, we could say that even uh, some aquatic macrophytes are facilitated outside their native range by uh, droughts. And here one example of terrestrial exotic plants in riparian corridors. You can see here that indeed the reduction of uh, flood magnitude and the reduction of water depth both increased the terrestrial exotic cover, showing that for these species of non uh, of, uh, for these exotic species, for these non-native species, the floods have a uh, sorry, the droughts have a positive role. Finally, I found far less evidences that the drought decrease the non-native species success. And I found only one example for parasites, one for invertebrates, and one for amphibians. But this also occurs. Okay, the key messages of my third topic are that, first, the flood disturbance 
enhances non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems and in riparian corridors because flooding represents invasion windows in the form of resources availability and reduced biotic resistance. The restoralization, especially during droughts, enhances non-native species success in the aquatic terrestrial transition zones and also in riparian corridors. And again, the relation between the flood pools and non-native species invasion success is highly idiosyncratic owing to particularities of each river floodplain ecosystem and, of course, to species traits. My fourth topic. Uh, in this topic, uh, we, I will try to answer does the flood pools enhance the chances of coexistence between native and non-native species? Uh, yes, sometimes it happens. Uh, first of all, the coexistence between two species, and here we can consider, for example, the coexistence between a native and a non-native species, depends basically on the niche overlap and on the fitness of both species. And one can state that, in general, the chances of coexistence enhances if the niche overlap is small and if the fitness of both species is similar. So, these two characteristics enhance the possibilities of species coexistence. In this case, a native and a non-native species. Uh, what is important when we talk about river floodplain ecosystems in these contests is that the flood pools and the degree of connectivity change both the niche overlap as well as the species fitness. And this way, the coexistence also changes and it can enhance or decreasing or decreases according to the flood pools. Okay, I will show you uh, some evidences where the flood pools enhances the chances of coexistence. Uh, this is a case for a river, a river flooded plain in Oregon, the United States, where the native fish uh, increases its populations during the high water period, while the non-native fish has the opposite trend. So it seems in this case that the flood pools facilitates one species uh, during a peculiar part of the flood pools, while the other species is, facilit is facilitated in the other period of the flood pools. So there is not a synchronous development of the populations. And in this case, we can say that the flood pools maybe enhances the chance of coexistence. In this case, also for fish, uh, this shows a different perspective and you can say that uh, you can see sorry you can see that for the native species what happens is that it changes the type of food it uses from the high to the low water level and maybe while the the non-native species remains with its uh, food almost the same during the high and the low water levels. So maybe the change of the food of the, uh, that is used by the native species over the year, which is caused by the flood pools, maybe this change enhances the possibility of coexistence between this native and this non-native species of fish. Uh, I talked in the last two slides about the coexistence of individual species, but maybe it happens for entire assemblages. Let's get a look at this figure, for example. You can see here, uh, this is a figure about 
uh, non uh, sorry, about trees in riparian zones, riparian corridors. And you can see that uh, at the habitat level, there is uh, uh, a significant correlation between the number of native and non-native species, evidencing that in some habitats, many more species of native species can coexist with many species of non-native species. And the same happens for fish. This is another example of the high uh, or the upper Paraná River floodplain, where there are evidences that uh, the increase of native species of fish is, uh, co po uh, the, uh, is correlated positively with the increase of non-native species of fish. So, first of all, I would say that these positive correlations between native and non-native species that are found in river floodplain ecosystems, this type of pattern is found in several other types of ecosystems. And they are against the idea we have about the role of biotic resistance. So we usually, uh, we usually state that the native species offer resistance against non-native species. This is the basic, uh, basics of the, the, the uh, biotic resistance hypothesis. And what you show here is the opposite. And it's called in, in, biolog uh, in the biology invasion field as biotic acceptance hypothesis. According to the biotic acceptance, acceptance hypothesis, uh, places which have more native species, they also have more non-native species. And this type of pattern is found in large spatial uh, scales. So at a level of uh, big habitats, uh, uh, more extensive habitats at the level of floodplains, for example, we find these positive correlations. And what explains these positive correlations between native and non-native species, which is the opposite of the resistance, um, resist biotic resistance hypothesis? What explains basically are two factors. First, is that at large spatial, spatial scales, there are more habitats the habitat heterogeneity increases, uh, what allows the coexistence of native and non-native species in different patches of habitats. Uh, the second explanation is that at large spatial, spatial scales, there is also an increase in the total, um, in the total quantity of resources, which may also allow the coexistence of both native and non-native species. Uh, what's not clear in this case is how and if the flood pools uh, mediate uh, these positive correlations between native and non-native species. So I think this is still an open question. Okay, the key messages of this topic is that uh, seasonal changes related with the flood pools may cause a symmetry between population attributes of native. Uh, sorry, people, to interrupt the lecture of May because there was a problem with the with the projection that uh, Thiago is going to fix, and we continue. I notice now that there is yeah, and no native there. species, okay. allowing their coexistence, and that. Uh, there are examples of entire assemblages of native and non-native species coexisting in river floodplain ecosystems habitats. My last topic, uh, it will be uh, very short, the last one, and I will talk about how the impacts caused by human may change the fate of non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. Okay, at short term, we can say that uh, river flow, flow regulation is a red uh, uh, rule in most river floodplain ecosystems in the world. So these changes are already uh, shown in several uh, uh, river floodplain ecosystems and they are affecting 
they are affecting the non-native species success. So, according to Catford uh, and colleagues, uh, we can state that changes of the disturbance dynamic related to the flood pools, rather than the flood pools per se, enhance the invasion. Note here that this is another perspective. One could say that it's not the flood, for example, that is enhancing the invasion success, but is the change that has been caused by humans in the flood pools that is indeed the responsible for the enhanced invasibility of river floodplain ecosystems. Indeed, uh, most cases I showed you in the previous slides come from river floodplain ecosystems which have been deeply regulated by human interference. So one cannot state if this enhanced invisibility are caused by floods themselves or by the changes of the natural flood pools caused by humans. In this regard, there are also several evidences that the flow rehabilitation, sorry, that the flow rehabilitation, what means the uh, rehabilitation of the natural flood pools, what we, call, we, what we would call designed disturbances, may enhance native species relative to non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems and riparian corridors. In this sense, it seems that really, uh, if you reestablish the natural flood pools in several river floodplain ecosystems, the natives will come back and several invasion, invasive species will not exist anymore in these river floodplain ecosystems. I will show you only one example, and this example deals about plant species inhabiting the aquatic terrestrial transition zone. Uh, they are a species of non-native grasses in this floodplain ecosystem in Australia. And you can see here that a major flood that resembles a natural flood was responsible for a clear decrease in the number of non-native grasses in this river floodplain ecosystems. In other words, in this peculiar floodplain ecosystems, the reestablishment of the natural flood contributed to decrease the non-native success. In some cases, even non-native species uh, are decreased when the natural uh, floods comes to their natural, as is the case of water hyacinth again. As I said some slides uh, before, uh, if you reestablish fl the flood regime in river floodplain ecosystems, these plants are washed out of the floodplains, and some control is possible when the natural floods are reestablished. Okay, differently from these short-term events, uh, events. Of course, nowadays uh, we are worried about the global changes, and these uh, changes uh, of the uh, that will come with the global changes will obviously also affect the river floodplain ecosystems and the success of invasive species. And this probably will occur mainly through alterations in the flood pools dynamics, because. In some places, in some uh, river floodplain ecosystems, uh, there will be an increase in rainfall. And thus, we will expect in these river floodplain ecosystems an increase of flooding. In contrast, in other regions, there will be an increase in droughts. In this case, the flood pools will not be so huge, and droughts will be the pattern. So, these changes are very peculiar again, and I will broadly uh, and based on this paper by Diaz et al. 
give some possibilities in regard to uh, extreme events caused by global change. First, regions with higher rainfall, what we would, what would we expect in these regions? First of all, an increase, an enhancing transport of non-native species owing to big floods that will probably occur in regions, in regions where the floods will uh, be more intense in response to rainfall. And also an enhancement of non-native species establishment because the, uh, there will be a reduced native species populations due to altered flood pools. So if the flood pools is changed, several native populations will have their numbers reduced, what will probably reduce or decrease the biotic resistance. And of course, big floods will enhance in these regions with higher rainfalls, what will probably uh, contribute to spread of non-native species inside the floodplain and also outside the floodplain, contributing to the role of floodplains as stopping stones for new invasions. In contrast, regions suffering lower rainfall regimes will probably experience an enhancement of terrestrialization, leading to an increase of non-native species success, especially in the aquatic terrestrial transition zones and in riparian corridors, in river floodplain ecosystems in general. Key messages. Flow regulation already changes the balance between native and non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems all over the world. Extreme climatic events caused by climate change will also influence non-native species, but their response is again highly idiosyncratic. Depending on whether a particular river floodplain ecosystem is in a region where rainfall will increase or decrease. Okay, in summary and finishing, propagul pools, I can say you, this is a pattern in river floodplain ecosystems. And this is uh, shown in dozens of investigations. So, so I would say that the propagul pools, which is related with floods and with increased connectivity in river floodplain ecosystems, is a pattern. Flooding seems to enhance invasive success in several river floodplain ecosystems but the responses to the flood pools are highly idiosyncratic. Maybe, maybe looking at the species traits will give important hints on the fate of non-native species in river floodplain ecosystems. So maybe this is the, the way we will find a more predictable findings, results. Finally, extremely Climatic events will affect invasive success through changes in rainfall, which in turn affects the natural flood pools. Okay, just to finish my talk, um, when we find such large degree of idiosyncrasy, sometimes this is frustrating, and then every time I face uh, uh, let's say a pattern that is almost a lack of pattern. I always read again this and other papers written by Simberloff, which says in regard to the apparent absence of general laws in community ecology that maybe rather it's the nature of the beast. <laughs> so maybe this is really the, the nature of the beast and we have to deal with this apparent, uh, apparent uh, lack of uh, clear patterns in river floodplain ecosystems. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you again, Coca and everybody for this invitation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ney, for your great talk about biological invasions in, in, in floodplain systems. Before we start the questions to Ney, I would like to apologize for the mistake we did with uh, the abstract of his lecture in the book of abstracts. We will fix this and all the other mistakes we might have done. If you guys have any correction to make in the book of abstracts, or if you wish to include now on, on the book, the link to the video with your presentation, please fill the Google form I have just sent to you through the chat here. And, uh, and I will send it later too through email. We will publish a revised and final, then it's final version of the book of abstracts for you to save and watch the videos again, as long as the authors keep them available on YouTube or Vimeo, of course. You can also watch the videos uh, at our Moodle system until the end of this month. Next month, we will need to remove them from the platform, okay? So, uh, Ney, let's see uh, how many questions we have now. Uh, we have already four questions. The first from Nestor, uh, the Saras Institute in Uruguay. Ney, Nice to see you again. Thanks for the inspiring talk. I kept thinking about your unique case adjective. Shallow lakes located in the fluid plane. I fully agree. In these systems, the fluid pose is a disturbance, remove biomass, and at the same time provides propagus, propagus. However, I believe that the theoretical framework of terrestrial ecosystems associated with the gap clearing dynamics due to natural or human disturbances are of great relevance in the study of floodplains. What do you think? Abraço, Nestor. Hi, Nestor. It would be much better to be with you. Yes, of course, uh, I deeply agree with you. And indeed, if you, you have noticed, uh, most of these flood plans we, that I, I provide examples, they have been changed. So they are influenced by human disturbances. What makes very difficult to see, I mean, what, what caused this, uh, some patterns that we found, the, the flood pools itself or the transformations. So if I understood your, your, your question, yeah, exactly, bringing this, um, theory from, from the terrestrial uh, ecosystems, where human disturbance is very important, uh, would be also in the same way important to explain the success in river floodplain ecosystems. So uh, no doubt about that, Nestor, no doubt. Now a question from our good old friend, Pedro Perez. Hi, Pedro. Uh, uh, I think he, he, he wrote it twice, I think there are two from him. Uh, yeah. Hi, Ney. Thanks for the great talk. It would have been great to see you. The so it, se it seems that it's difficult to predict well what makes a successful invader in floodplain systems. Would perhaps the answer be in the identifying the life history traits of successful invasives in floodplain systems that would make them not good invaders in more stable systems? Uh, Thank you, Pedro. It would be great to see you and Coca and Renata, everybody together. Uh, again, there is a high degree of syncrasy in, in, in this point. And uh, just to let you know, I, I, I took this opportunity and I, I wrote a paper that has been submitted with my presentation. And of course, there are several other examples there. So in short, it's true that really some of these species uh, whose life history are associated with uh, disturbances, natural disturbances, do not do, you, do well in, in, written, in stable ecosystems, maybe because of their traits. But what I, what I found is also the opposite again. I, I will give you only one example. Uh, Cicla is a fish, for example. Uh, peacock bass, everybody knows that's peacock bass. The peacock is native to floodplains in North Amazon. However, it grows and establishes much better in reservoirs which are stable than in other floodplains. 
So again, I would say that there is a great degree of idiosyncrasy. So um, first, I think you are correct. In some cases, this is true. And these species do not go, do well, do not establish because they are not uh, associated. Uh, they do not have life histories associated with uh, stable habitats. But the, the opposite is not true, as is the case I, I, I offered you now. Carp is another good example. Carp is, uh, uh, has its life history associated with flood plants, but it grows and establishes wells in other types of established of uh, stable habitats. So again, I would say that there is a great degree of idiosyncrasy. And um, the, at the end of my talk, I did not talk a lot of, about this, but I'm very happy because you talked about this and, 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 and look, the Mr. and others talk about the same issue. Maybe traits will be the, the solution uh, to decrease this degree of idiosyncrasy. Looking for traits, okay. I'm not. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, now I hear. Sorry, uh, there are no questions here in the questions and answer at the moment. So guys, if you want to uh, send some questions to Ney, please write in the question and answer. Eneida Eskinazi. Uh, Ney, thanks for the inspiring talk. Do you believe that uh, that area of effects would influence the patterns of biological invasions in floodplain ecosystems. I mean, larger floodplain systems would be more resilient to biological invasions. Uh, thank you for the question. In general terms, yes, yes, I do believe that. Um, for example, uh, there are, uh, I showed you in, in several cases, there is a good positive correlation between native and non-native species. If, if you take this as a, a, um, a, 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 let's say that number of species is correlated with area, so I would expect the same. But I would say that nowadays uh, floodplains are so ex extensively uh, changed that area would, would be second uh, in regard to this issue. So maybe the, the changes that have been promoted in floodplains would be, be the first case. Of course, area is important, but I think it's secondary nowadays. Right. Any more questions? Luke is uh, greeting you, hi, Ney. Hi, Luke. Thank you for amazing talk yesterday. Now the question. Hi, Ney, thanks for the talk. From Luke, the, que the question. Uh, I really liked the Propago uh, Pulse idea. Might it be that the success, but also the coexistence might be a direct result of mass effects, perhaps even more than the disturbance. Uh, that means also Propago Pulses of the natives. Of natives, excellent point, Luke, excellent point. At the same time that the propagu pulse enhances the, uh, pro, uh, the, the success of non-native, of course, they has maybe even more of the native species. So uh, this is a good point, very good point. It's maybe we find, we would find, we would find to have a way to separate these uh, two uh, possibilities, these, these two mechanisms. Um, how would the, the, the pro propagate use of natives contribute also to this coexistence. Yes, yes, this is a very good point. Thank you, but it's true, I agree, because they are also uh, associated with the, the flood pools. All right. Uh, I cannot see any more questions here. And if there are not any questions left, I would like to thank you very much, Ney, for, you. for your talk and for all the, the work you have done. Uh, 